Um, so our focus for today's session is really make sure everyone has an understanding of Blueprint APS um, and the why we are repurposing schools, which I just gave you a little bit of preview. Learn more about our process for repurposing, uh, which hasn't fully launched yet, but this is kind of the preview and the information um, to let you know what that will look like. Learn how you can be involved in that process, whether you are interested in being uh, providing input to help shape that process and help shape what uh, build, how buildings are repurposed, whether you are interested in potentially uh, a building for repurposing, or you just want to stay informed around what's happening um, in the community or share with others. Um, and so really, a, and we'll give you a chance at the end to ask questions. So why Blueprint APS? Um, as we talked about, as I mentioned, this is where we started having these conversations back in 2017 and really delved into it. Really delved into it in 2018 um, because we as a district needed a new master plan. Our master plan had uh, expired. Uh, we had a, a master plan that started in about the mid-2000s and typically master plans are about 10 years. Um, and so it, uh, we had one that had expired. And Aurora, as many of you are familiar with, had really changed and shifted. Um, there had been lots of plans prior to the Great Recession in 2008 uh, that didn't necessarily come to fruition uh, because of sort of uh, changing in housing and the economic recession. Um, and the demographics were also shifting in Aurora. We had uh, plans then for new developments that started to emerge in the eastern part of the district. And we also saw shifts in population, uh, sorry, yeah, in the, uh, in, the western, in the western part of the district. And so we as a district said we needed to have a new master plan to really envision what the long term of Aurora Public Schools would look like. Um, as I said, we were seeing that shift in enrollment, right? Really declines, um, particularly in the Northwest region uh, in this area that we are uh, located right now. Um, and that's for a few reasons, right? One of the biggest reasons is actually we're seeing declining birth rates uh, overall as a society, not just here in Colorado. Um, so seeing fewer kids enroll in schools. We're also seeing more students um, opt for different options, whether that is uh, charter schools or enrolling in other schools outside of their neighborhood or boundary. So really seeing shifts um, in you know, the size that, and the number of students that our schools were actually enrolling. And we also saw it as an opportunity to really ask the community what they wanted um, for the future of education in Aurora Public Schools. So rather than just saying we're going to, you know, rather than just saying, you know what, we need to make changes in our enrollment areas and our, our schools, really we started by asking the community, what do you want it to look like? What is the type of educational programming you, um, you desire? What are your needs and interests? And what do you think the community needs? So that we could really pair that um, with sort of the facility changes. And so that's how we ended up with um, Blueprint APS and have been engaging in this work, really outlining and defining um, what Blueprint APS entails um, in 2018 and 2019, and then really beginning the implementation phases um, in 2020 and uh, uh, 2020, 2021, and now uh, in 2022. Next slide. So a little bit about how we got to what we call our Blueprint APS scenario, process, or scenario. Um, we started, as I said, this work in 2018, really asking the community. We talked to thousands of folks throughout the community um, through a variety of mechanisms, um, through interviews, through surveys, through focus groups, um, through, through town halls, community sessions, to really ask people what they wanted, what they valued, um, and what they wanted to see in Aurora Public Schools. We had um, an amazing group of uh, two groups, of both one group that was primarily community members, uh, one group that was staff members that really had the chance to envision then how do we take what we're hearing from the community and come up with a number of potential options for our school board to consider for what the future of APS would look like in that education and facilities plan. So that was that second phase. Um, we brought that to our board, all those different options. I believe there are about five scenarios that we brought to our board in 2019. Uh, the board looked at those, considered those, and went back out to the community with those scenarios to ask them for more information and more feedback on those scenarios, which parts they liked, which parts they maybe wanted to change or modify, um, and ultimately uh, decided to move forward, taking actually a few pieces, and developing a new scenario that took a few pieces of each of those 
to say here's what we want for, uh, here's what the community, we think the community based on what we heard um, wants and what that scenario looks like moving forward. Next slide. Really focused, one of the things we heard a lot was what was folks wanted more um, kind of career connected learning opportunities, chances for students to have real world experiences um, and leverage the assets that we saw in the community. And so that scenario um, really focuses on, make, on thinking about the assets we have here in Aurora and divides our district up into seven regions. Each of those regions then is attached to what uh, we call a specialization, a real area of focus that's based around many of the assets of the community. So for example, you'll see here, um, we have our One Health region, that's where we are right now, which makes a lot of sense given our proximity to the Anschutz campus, um, as well as other opportunities uh, here in the region. Our uh, region three is our visual and performing arts, which if you come through uh, the center of Aurora, of, uh, of Aurora, you'll see things like Dava or the art center or the Fox Theater, right? So really trying to connect to the assets of the community. We heard from our community, um, and so the, the reason we, we wanted to align to these assets was we saw that it would be really important to make sure that our students were connecting to things that they could see outside of their own classrooms, right? Things they would see in their community, um, things that they could connect to um, even when they're not actually directly in the classroom. The other, so really making sure we have those opportunities for, stu for our students um, connecting to the, to the community assets. The other thing we heard is we heard from a lot of our families that they wanted more district-run choice opportunities. They wanted to be able to continue to have uh, their neighborhood or their boundary school, right, one that they are assigned to, um, so that they know where they live, they have a great option, um, but also then that they could have more choices if their student had a particular interest they were interested in. Um, and they wanted those, uh, not necessarily charters, but run by the district. Um, and so we had, uh, so part of this scenario includes expanding our APS run magnet school opportunities that would be open to all students throughout the district um, and really allow us to focus on a specific specialization. So for example, um, this year we actually just opened our, uh, two of our magnet campuses, um, one in Region 3, the Charles Burrell Perfor uh, Visual and Performing Arts Academy, um, which is uh, located in Region 3 um, on the former campus of uh, Peoria Elementary and Aurora Central, and, and is part of Aur uh, Aurora Central High School, and then also the Clara Brown Entrepreneurial Academy, which is located in our Region 5. Um, and so all of this to say, complementing what we would see, which is that shift, that, ba that boundary school, um, that system of boundary schools. Really a shift though from what we previously referred to as neighborhood schools, because that usually suggests something really, really tight, right? That we needed to, because of the changing enrollment, broaden and slightly enlarge those boundaries um, so that these would be boundary schools. So students are still have a boundary school that they are connected to, but really needing to, um, to broaden those boundaries because of, so that we could provide the resources for our students um, given as we're seeing that shift in enrollment. So that's the scenario that we're talking through that has really guided our work and, as I said, guided those tough decisions around needing to um, cl close several schools. Um, so as part of that scenario, one of the things we indicated was the need that we would need to be repurposing several schools. Um, we would need to be repurposing schools that, were, that, would, be, that would potentially be closing, thinking about other uses, um, and you do that in a number of different ways. And so when we started this, when we started this back in 2019, said these buildings could be repurposed in a whole bunch of different ways. They could just be, you know, uh, repurposing essentially meaning changing from how it was currently used to something different. So that could mean everything from um, an elementary school expanding to be a P through eight, uh, a, a preschool through eighth grade, um, uh, school because we see that sometimes the transit transitions um, can be challenging for students as they move from elementary to middle school and middle school to high school. That could mean using those buildings for magnet schools. As we said, that was something we heard from the community. Um, and so that is something that, as I shared, that we have done with a couple of our buildings, repurposed them for magnet schools. Or it could be for other things such as community centers or other um, district uses or other choice offerings. Um, it could also mean consolidation of buildings or even closing of school buildings and then using them for an alternative use. And so we knew, So now we are in this position where we're really talking about, we know some of the uses that we will have, 
um, and really talking about um, how we will use some of these other buildings. So since 2019, um, our school board um, has made the decision to close eight schools. Um, you'll see them listed here, I won't read them all um, for you. And some of them we've made decisions on how they are used. Um, so for example, um, as I shared, uh, Wheeling Elementary School, which was closed, has now um, reopened as the Clara Brown Entrepreneurial Academy, um, serving grades K through three, I believe, this year, and then we'll continue to grow and expand ultimately to a K-8. Uh, Peoria Elementary School was a boundary school and has now been repurposed into um, an arts magnet school, again, serving grades K through three and six, um, and then ultimately will continue to grow uh, to become a K through eight school. Um, South Middle School, which is currently in its last year, um, we, our students are, we're phasing out, it will be transitioned, has started to, and will continue to transition into an online learning center. Obviously, COVID has changed uh, the way learning happens, um, and so, we're, so we've seen that need, that growth and that need for remote learning and opportunities for students not only to learn online, we have students who are, who are enrolled in our three through eight program, um, which is something we started really during the pandemic, but also then a chance and a space where they could pop in if they needed more in-person support and a place for our teachers to teach from. And so South Middle School will be repurposed into that um, remote learning center. Um, we also have, um, and then we have Century Elementary School. Um, Century Elementary School um, currently houses part of our online learning program, um, but next year one of the things we've seen is, we ha uh, is we've seen an increased need for a lot of some of our behavioral supports for our um, students with special needs. And so we will be continuing that we currently have that co-located with one of our schools. We need some additional space, and so we'll be moving that into Century Elementary School, repurposing that building uh, into the Sierra School to allow us to better serve our students and make sure that we have the resources and facilities to serve those students. So at the end of this current school year, um, we do have four schools that will be closing and those facilities will um, be, we are looking at repurposing. Um, Paris, where we currently are located, Sable Elementary, Sixth Avenue, um, and then South, as I spoke about, um, which will become our uh, remote, fully remote learning center. Is this where I kick it to you? Sure. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Mackenzie. Awesome. Thanks for covering all of that background. So we're going to kind of transition into talking about now what are we, where are we going from here? Right, so we are sitting in one of the buildings that will be closing at the end of the school year. Um, and thank you to Mario for allowing us to be here today. Um, so there are two different regions. As Christy mentioned, we have, uh, Blueprint has sp split the district into seven different regions. Um, and currently, two of the schools that are closing at the end of this school year are in Region 1, which is where we currently are, the One Health region. And one of the schools, 6th Avenue, is in Region 3. Um, and so we have really been trying to be intentional about having conversations regionally with our community um, because, as we know, there are different parts of Aurora have different community members, different priorities. Um, and so we are continuing with grouping those schools by region to have future conversations about what the building should be repurposed for. Next slide. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what this process is going to look like. Again, as Christy mentioned, this has not been fully launched yet, um, but this is a time to you know, be able to share this information with you prior to the launch um, and kind of give you an idea of, of what you can expect as a community member and also really want to highlight all of the different ways that you can be involved in this process. So um, currently, Technically, right, we're in phase one of this process. So the, the repurposing process will be sort of handled in three different phases. The first phase really is all about gathering information from community members and getting input. Um, this is really important in the process because um, they're, the materials that we'll be using and the priorities that we'll be talking about as far as repurposing will all come back to aligning with the feedback and input that we receive from the community. So in phase one, um, we're gonna be doing a couple different things, uh, community information sessions. One of them is right now, that's what you're here um, attending today. We are also gonna be having input sessions. And those input sessions are extremely important. There are flyers on your tables. If you could please take those with you and share that with um, uh, your contacts to make sure that we get lots of engagement at those. 
Um, we will be collecting information from our community during the input sessions. Um, and then we're also going to be uh, submitting a, a community-wide survey that will go out to all APS staff, families, um, and students to be able to provide input on what are their priorities for their community and what are the facility use priorities that they have um, as, the, as we're looking forward into the future for particular buildings. Phase two um, will be our call for proposals. So APS will be actually releasing a request for proposals or RFP, if you've heard that term before. Um, and it will be published. Essentially, we're gonna be asking the community to submit proposals for the reuse of some of our closed buildings. Um, this process will be open to the entire community. It is not um, explicitly just for one particular school or staff or, or a group of folks, but it is open to anyone to submit those proposals. Um, we will also be conducting some building open houses. So um, those uh, that are interested in submitting proposals for our repurpose use uh, will be able to come and actually walk through the facility and get a better idea for what the building is. Um, and then we're also currently, we currently have a request for information out right now that's going to close next week that will um, ask for our community to provide supports for those who are interested in writing proposals that may need support in that area or help with visioning. Um, and so we will hopefully in the next two weeks or so have um, some organizations identified that can be support for, for those who want to submit proposals for building reuse. Um, and then phase three, which will be in February, moving towards the end of the school year, the intent is that we have um, direction for these uh, particular two buildings in Region 1 by the end of the school year. Um, and so the goal is that we uh, complete the evaluation of proposals between February and May. Um, and I'm going to go through, the next few slides are going to go through a lot more in detail about what that looks like, who's involved in that process, um, to kind of give you a better idea of what that will, what that will look like. Next slide. So phase one, as I mentioned before, we are now prior to the proposal deadline. We are focused solely right now on gathering input. Um, so we will be conducting a couple of different sessions. You move to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned before, today is one of our two information sessions. Um, we will be also recording this session right now and posting it on our website for anyone who's unable to attend. Um, they can listen to this online. Um, but the next information session will be next week at Sable. Um, and these are really just to provide you all with uh, the information about what to expect and also to provide a space for you to ask questions um, and better understanding uh, what this process is all about. Um, the, the input sessions are different in the sense that we're actually um, going to be having those sessions facilitated by a third party Keystone Policy Center. Um, they have been very instrumental in helping through the entire Blueprint APS process um, and getting people to uh, really think about what's important to them and what they want to see. So the questions that will be asked during this in these input sessions are really two, two, two main questions. One is, what, what are your priorities as a community member? Um, and what do you value about your community? And secondly, what kind of future facility uses um, matter to you? What, what do you think would be something that would be impactful or beneficial for your community? Um, and these sessions are very important because uh, the input that we receive in those sessions are going to be directly printed into our RFP. Um, and so when we receive proposals for building reuse, it will be already stated, you know, our community has said these are the things that matter to them. Um, and it will also be incorporated into um, our evaluation tools, and I'll go over that a little bit more in detail. Um, we will also have a survey, as I mentioned. We know, we know that our community members, although we try to have sessions at different times and different days for you to be able to come in person, we know that not everybody can attend an input session, um, and so we will have very, very similar questions in our survey that we will be using in our input session. Um, and we hope to gain as many responses as we can from our community to be able to provide input on via that way as well. Next slide. 
So the phase two portion of the proposal process will be us actually releasing that um, RFP. It will be published on December 5th and it will be closing in fe on February 10th. So there'll be that period of time um, that APS will be collecting proposals. Next slide. So here is just a kind of high level overview of what we will be asking for in a request for in, in the proposal. So um, if somebody is interested in submitting a proposal for the reuse of a building, um, these are the seven main categories of things that we will be asking for. Um, obviously, the actual RFP will be much more detailed than this, but this just kind of provides a general overview of what we're asking for. Um, first, you know, we will be asking for who, who is the proposal team or, or individual that is uh, presenting the proposal um, and information about any partnerships they have or organizations that they are working with. Uh, second is what the actual terms are, right? So if we have a, we have a facility, um, the proposal will either be for the purchase of a building, the lease of a building, or the continued district use of a building. It really have, falls into one of those three categories. Um, we'll also be asking for, I think that the major part of it here is what, what is the proposal, right? What is the project description? What, is, what are you planning to do with this facility? Um, four is the budget and funding, so supportive budget, and also presenting any information about um, any sources of funding, any um, uh, secured financing. Um, the schedule will just provide a more realistic understanding of how will this project actually come to fruition in X building um, that is the proposal is being submitted for. Um, and then the applicability, this, this particular um, part of the proposal is necessary because uh, for I can say generally for repurposing, right, we have to also work with other entities like the city of Aurora. We have zoning requirements for buildings. We have building codes that we have to work within. Um, and so there will be a portion of the proposal that just has um, a statement around um, either the feasibility of that proposal within the current building code and code or zoning or um, uh, the plan for you know being able to adjust that or request something different um, and then I think most importantly the last uh, the last part of what we'll be asking in the proposal is for a statement of impact and alignment so um, how will this proposal impact the immediate community but also how will it impact students um, because our students right are being impacted by school closure and so there is another layer of impact too of how we repurpose buildings so there will be a request for a statement around impact and then also how is this proposal aligned with those values and priorities that we received during phase one so we're in phase one right now as i said input sessions survey those things are going to be published in our rfp so uh, it'll be important that our proposals are able to demonstrate how do they align or do they not align with those values and priorities. Next slide. Lost connection again. <laughs> oh, no. It's... Oh, sorry. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, there will be three categories of proposals. It will either be for the purchase of a building, the lease of a building, and the third category um, is for the proposal for continued district use of the facility. Uh, this category is reserved for current EPS staff um, or folks that are internal that are saying, you know what, this is a great idea for this facility, this is the need. Um, they will still be going through this process to be able to demonstrate all of the same things that any proposal would be uh, being asked for. Um, but those are the three uh, different categories that we, that we would be asking for proposals for. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, um, a couple of supports that we have uh, put in place for this process is obviously today being able to provide this information in a detailed way and, and provide it on our website. If any of you need to um, lead anyone back to this information, this slide deck and recording will be online so you can access it at any time. Um, 
And then as far as the proposal development, we know that there are there may be people that have great ideas for a facility but may not have the mechanisms or ability to be able to um, go through a full proposal process. So um, in a couple of weeks, like I mentioned, when our RFI closes, we should have a list of organizations that have said, hey, we're willing to be here to support. We can either support through visioning, um, helping with drafting proposals, and then also just maybe facilitating people to come together and talk about their ideas. So there will be that proposal development assistance as well. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we'll also be having open houses. I do not have definitive dates at this time, but I do know that um, there will be an open house for this particular facility in the first couple weeks of December, as well as um, at Sable Elementary within the first, I believe, two weeks of December. So as we move into phase three, um, I think it's really important that we are transparent in this process and we are very um, clear about how these proposals will be scored and evaluated. So um, the evaluation is going to be done in two different stages, and they'll be distinct, dif distinctly different stages. Um, and you can actually go to the next slide. I'll go through in more detail. So the first phase um, of evaluation, you can think, I guess, of, of it as really a technical evaluation. Um, uh, similar to uh, receiving any other type of application, right? They have to check the box as far as did they give us all the information we need to conduct an evaluation and are they meeting the basic requirements. So in the first phase, um, the, uh, we're calling the Repurpose Proposal Review Committee, uh, will be a group of internal APS staff that are doing the evaluation of uh, proposals at first glance. Um, and this is really uh, a technical review. So this committee will be looking at these um, six different criteria. Um, a lot of it is focused on, um, you know, is this financially feasible? Is this something that can actually happen in this particular building? And what I mean by that is, um, if we want to turn Paris into an aquatic center, is that really going to, like, meet muster with the city of Aurora? Those kinds of things. Um, so there's really kind of the, the financial review, physical, you know, structure review. Um, and then also implementation feasibility, some of those things I just mentioned, is it actually doable to be able to do that in this particular building? Um, and then also alignment to both the districts and the community's priorities and values. So in the RFP, the district's, uh, the district's priorities and values are established very clearly by stating, um, you know, these are the district's strategic goals and this is the vision of the district. Um, it's very simple as far as district uh, uh, priorities and values. The community priorities and values, this is yet to be filled in, right? Because we are going to be collecting that information over the next few weeks during these input sessions and also during the survey. So all of that information is going to be compiled and put in the RFP. Um, and so our committee will be doing a check to see, does an aquatic center line up f with the, the district? district's priorities or the community's priorities to have a learning center, right? It, it, it's a very, uh, again, technical review at this point. Um, we will be using an actual scorecard that has a rubric aligned to these um, on a scale of a couple, you know, points, one to five, I believe. Um, and so proposals that score the highest through this uh, process will then move on to the next stage. Oh, and, and just to give more clarity as far as that committee, so the, the committee that's actually doing this initial scoring, um, there are representatives, or they're going to be representatives of APS staff from these different departments. And again, this is by design because these, these folks have expertise in things like understanding budgets for facilities and being able to um, understand building codes and, and things of that nature. So um, this is just to give more, more information on who will be in the committee. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, proposals that score high on that initial review will then move into phase two. So phase two will be asking those uh, proposal teams, if you will, to actually come present their ideas publicly to the community. Um, we'll be hosting sessions where, and, and at this point we have no idea how many that will be. Um, it could be one, it could be five, it could be 10. I really have no idea at this point. Um, but we will provide a space for those top proposals that meet those basic requirements to be able to present publicly. 
Those sessions will be open to the entire community. Um, they will not be RSVP based, they'll just be open. Um, we will have interpretation and translation available as well. Um, and we're going to be asking those proposal teams to um, present their ideas and also be able to answer questions. Um, if the community has questions about those proposals and, and be able to, to uh, answer those publicly. Um, additionally, we want to incorporate um, community feedback from that, this particular stage in the final recommendations by um, also gathering input via an exit survey. So folks that attend these sessions, they'll be also asked to uh, provide information on an exit survey that gives feedback on the proposals they've heard um, and also information or additional questions they might have for those teams. Um, lastly, um, so all of, that, all of that together, right, will then um, culminate in a final recommendation on the repurpose of a particular facility. So um, most likely the superintendent or leadership team would be making that recommendation uh, to our APS board. But in fact, there are some instances where um, the board does not have to approve a repurposed decision on a facility. And I'll talk through that on the next slide as well. Um, but regardless, a recommendation will hopefully culminate out of this process that will have um, these things incorporated into it, right? We have an initial scorecard that talks about feasibility, finances, uh, physical facilities, um, the feedback from the presentation, so that's coming from the community, and the guiding principles of our repurposing process, which I actually believe I don't think we covered in this presentation, but um, I can come back to that. Next slide. So um, I know we get the question, or, or a lot of people think, well, what are the kinds of proposals we might get for a, a repurpose of a school facility? Um, as I mentioned previously, it's really going to most likely be one of three things. Um, a proposal for the proposed reuse of a building for a district use. Um, this could come internally, this could come externally, um, but uh, and these are just some listed um, impacts. Right? If we continue to own the, the facility and use it for a district use, uh, we have continued maintenance and operation costs, um, continued oversight, and also whatever that potentially program might look like, we continue to oversee, oversee that. Um, we might get a proposal for a, the purchase of a building. Um, now, it's important to remember too that um, because, you know, as Christy mentioned back in the original intent of Blueprint, and we've had to struggle with declining enrollment, um, we want to be able to serve our students more equitably across the district. And that becomes really difficult when you're running schools at very low capacity or regions at very low capacity. Um, so in the, in the uh, scenario of a purchase, it may be that the revenue from that purchase is then used to be able to pour back into students back into the schools they are now attending or into programs or administrations. And then as far as a lease goes, there could also be a proposal to, uh, for an organization who wants to lease this facility from the district. Um, we may have continued operations, um, but the financial burden of, of operating a uh, building at low capacity is, has been lessened at that point. So I mentioned before, um, some repurposed proposals or recommendations may not need board approval. Um, so this is kind of a complicated, lots of information on here, but this is really just to share different, different things that um, the board ha would be voting on versus um, under the authority of just the superintendent to make that decision. Um, and so closing a school is, the board's, is a board's decision. Uh, if we decide to reallocate use of bond dollars, or if we decide to sell a building, the board has to vote on those decisions. Also, leases for uh, more than five years. Um, but the board may not have to vote um, if their proposal is for a lease that is less than five years, or there is a proposal to uh, co-locate different programs that we already operate into the same building, um, or if we change the grade configuration. So those are some other examples uh, of repurposing uses that may not require a board or would not require a board vote. Next slide. So um, we, we need your involvement uh, in this process. It's extremely important um, because as I've mentioned multiple times already, it informs the very uh, process in the beginning and 
and being able to establish the priorities and values of our community. So here's just a list of different ways that you can be involved. Attending a community session, inf uh, information session, which is right now, thank you for being here. Um, you can attend a facility open house. Uh, those dates will be forthcoming. You can also attend an input session. We would love for you to attend those. And again, those are listed on the flyer. Please share those with um, your contacts. Um, you could submit a response through our community survey. Um, and you could also submit a proposal <laughs> um, if you want to be that involved, right? So there are many different ways that you can be involved in this um, process and we hope that you will, will use those opportunities and share it with, with the folks that you have connections with. Next slide. Oh, yes, and you can also come to um, the uh, per community presentation. So when we have proposals that make presentations to the community, you may Attend those and submit your feedback uh, through an exit survey. I think I got them all. Yep. So as far as the upcoming information sessions, we're here today. There is going to be one next week at 5 p.m. at Sable Elementary. Um, and then the input sessions, we will have one virtual opportunity to attend an input session. And then the other two, um, we worked with our principals at both Sable and Paris to find a time that uh, they felt worked best for their families and engaging them. Um, and so uh, we will have those pretty much immediately after school ends um, to be able to get folks in the building and have those input sessions um, on those two days. So um, I don't know what time, oh yeah, we still have time for questions. So we can happily take questions, but I also wanna share we did add a repurposing tab onto the Blueprint EPS website on aurorak12.org. Um, and so we will be continuously updating that website. We will be adding the recording for today, um, for example. And then we also have an email address for any follow-up questions um, regarding this process or going forward. Um, and that email is repurposing at aurorak12.org. I believe that concludes our presentation.